Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. Father, we come before you this morning and we ask, Lord, that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit amongst us. We pray, Lord Jesus, that as we open your word and look at what you've got for us this morning, that you would speak to our hearts and that you would change our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, If you've got your Bibles, um, turn with me, please, to Acts and chapter 4. We're going to be reading from there uh, in a couple of uh, minutes. Um, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. We're going to be jumping in um, around uh, verse um, 23 is where we're going to be jumping in. Um, But uh, first, a little bit of background, because if I jump in straight away here, those of you that are maybe not familiar with this passage, um, it might not make full sense for everything else that's being said here this morning. So um, we're going to be um, looking at the uh, boldness, the subject of boldness today, okay? I believe that we are in a a time and we're in a place now in our society where we need to be bold as believers. We need to be bold in taking our stand for Christ, wherever that goes, whether that's in our workplace, whether that's in our families, whether that's even in the church, we need to be boldly taking a stand for the truth. And when we look at um, the the book of Acts here, we see the foundations, we see the forming uh, of the early church. And really, there's a a lot there, and I'm not going to attempt to cover the whole book of Acts. You could do, I think, an old pastor of mine that I grew up under um, uh, started a series on Acts, and I think two years later, he still had quite not completed it. Um, because the more he looked at it, the more he found he needed to break down each section into subsections. Um, So I'm not going to attempt to cover it all. That would be uh, totally ridiculous. Well, what we are going to do is we're going to look specifically at boldness in the passage here. This evening, we're going to take a little bit more of a general view of um, the church of the book of Acts, and we're going to look more at what is life like as the church of the book of Acts. Again, not saying that I'm going to cover it all, just going to pick out a few key attributes and factors, help us to have it. I'm calling it the Church of the Book of Acts, a reality check. That's what this evening's sermon is going to be. Hopefully that's whetted your appetite to get an early tea and make your way uh, here this evening. But this morning we're going to be focusing on boldness. And the early church, uh, we're dealing here by chapter 4, uh, Pentecost had happened in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit had come, um, signs and wonders were taking place, people were being healed, they were being set free, delivered. There was amazing stuff going on, and there was rapid growth in the church. There was... Uh, a huge number of salvations going on. We know that 3,000 people came to know the Lord on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and even here, uh, we find in this chapter, another 2,000 men, it says, were added. That's only men, so that's not counting women and children. Um, so we can assume, therefore, that there would have been far greater than 5,000 at that point. But the, the, the growth of the church and the move of the Holy Spirit created quite a stir amongst the religious leaders. It created a terrible stir. Be- why? Because their established order was threatened. They felt threatened because they had an established religious order that had been in place for a long, long time, and now it was at the point of being uh, threatened, Um, and, and, and rightly so, because there was a lot in that religious order that was fundamentally against God. It was fundamentally wrong, um, and it was man-made structures, man-made rules that was there to control people rather than what the purpose of the church and the religious leaders are meant to be, which is to train people up, equip people, and to release them into society. Okay, That's our job as the church now. Our job as leaders in the church is to equip you as the saints to go out into all the world and preach the gospel and to see people saved. It's not to control people. It's not, and, and sadly, that there is parts of the church that focus on that, and that's where religious dogma gets in the way. But the established order had been threatened here. And whenever the establishment feels threatened, they react. Right? Whenever they feel threatened, they react. What did we find under that um, uh, so-called pandemic a few years ago? Any discussion uh, as to whether medical treatments of certain varieties may not be quite as safe as suggested. Oh, shut down, cancelled. Closed. Blocked. And all over. There's a general rule I always go by, folks. If the establishment is not bothered by you, then you probably need to change something in your life. Because the establishment is not for God. 
So if the establishment is not bothered by you, then you probably need to change something in your life. I think about people like um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Here you have the leader of the most recognizable part of the global Anglican communion. Now, you would have thought that at a time in society when uh, maybe people are embracing God and the things of the Bible and, and Christian foundations, even just in values if they don't necessarily go along with it all themselves, that someone like Mr. Welby may well be quite a prominent figure in society and quite a well endeared uh, character, media appearances and so on and so forth. But in a society like our own, where it's hostile to God, where it's moving away from God, where there is far more hostility towards the people of God, you would expect the leaders of the church to be outcasts. You would not expect them to be part of the inner circle so I sit there and I wonder and it's a point to consider how on earth is it that Justin Welby somehow as a leader of a church at a time in a hostile society that is hostile to God suddenly seems to be endeared by the establishment something doesn't quite add up there for me but anyway back to Acts this uh, particular episode that we're going to read about here in, 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 cha in chapter 4 was triggered by the healing of a lame beggar outside the temple. We can read about that in chapter 3. He was a well-known uh, figure who was outside the temple. He was carried there. The, the Bible says he was carried there every day, and he sat there, um, and he couldn't walk. That's what being lame means. He, was, he could not walk, um, and it was, he was known for his lameness. So there's the lame beggar. Um, and because he was lame in those times, he couldn't get a job, so he didn't have an income, so he had no money either. So he was very poor in a, in a, a sorry state. But what happens is Peter and John come along, uh, and uh, he uh, sort of begs to them, uh, and Peter responds, well, I, 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 I'll give you what I have. And what he had was a prayer, and it was a prayer of healing. And he laid hands on him, and, uh, and, and he says, now take my hands and stand. And he stood up. And he walked. And this created an incredible stir because this man had been there uh, for many, many years. Um, every day outside the temple had become a fixture. And all of a sudden, this guy's walking around. So this creates a stir. And it was an undeniable miracle. The religious leaders knew that it was undeniable. They could not deny the validity of it. But they wanted to stop the spread of the gospel because it was threatening their established order. Problem for them, though, it had already spread too far. So they really didn't know how to tackle it. And just as you can't create joy artificially, you can't quell the joy of the Holy Spirit. You see, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and comes inside you, joy rises up. It's a natural reaction. It's a state of mind. It's, I have said it before, and I'll repeat it here again. You can be unhappily joyful. Stuart, hang on a second. That's a contradiction. What are you saying, man? I'm saying exactly what I said. Right? At my grandfather's funeral, I stood at the pulpit and I uh, uh, gave a, a eulogy where I said that I am not sad today because I know that my grandfather is more alive now than he ever has been. Right? Yes, I miss him. And there was emotions of sadness. But I was in a joyful state. I felt like partying that day. Right? Not out of control. Don't get worried. But I felt like partying because I knew where he was. He was in a better place. He had been released from all of the suffering that he had been going through for, for several years. And he was, in a, he was in a place of freedom, a place of no pain. I can't quell that joy because it comes from the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit starts moving, you've got a choice. You can either be a bystander and you can watch the Holy Spirit move, or you can jump in and reap the benefits. But you can't stop a move of God. When the Holy Spirit starts moving, you can't stop it. Don't try and stop it. It won't work. And this is the problem that these religious leaders came up against. They tried to stop the move of God. And I believe that right now in our society, however dry and dark and barren a land it's become, we are on the cusp of a mighty move of God. We are on the cusp of a mighty move of the Holy Spirit that is going to shake this nation. First, we're going to see revival in the church. And when the church is revived and equipped, it's going to go out into society. We're going to see people saved. And as a consequence, we're going to see reformation in society. Because revival Revival is for the church, reformation is for society. When people are saved, they change how they go about their lives. Changed people change societies. It's no good going into the pubs and saying, hey guys, who wants to turn this into a church? Because you'll just get a funny, few funny looks. But when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on and people are saved, then they will not want to be sitting there on a Sunday morning in the pub. I saw a lad in a football kit uh, um, I forgave him because it was a good football kit. No, sorry. Um, the, uh, running up the road this morning, obviously running late for a train to get to the football match. And I'm sitting there thinking, 
How great would it be if we saw people running because they were running late for church? Ah, I'm praying, I'm believing for those days. And folks, I, 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 the, the coming move of God is like a steam train. Um, a steam train that's in, in the station. You know, you, you, it doesn't really work with the new trains. You know, the, once that conductor locks the doors, you can't get on. It's all electronic. But on the old steam trains, you could, it starts whirring and the steam comes up and, and you can see the steam coming out, the locomotive, and, it, and, and the whistle blows and it starts to chug very, very slowly, doesn't it? It starts to move. But you can still run up the platform and jump on the train, Yeah. And I, that's what I see with the move of God. The move of God is coming, folks. It's time to jump on the train of revival if you want to. But it's not going to be waiting any longer in the station for you because God is about to move and he's about to do something. And he was doing something here in the early church. So what happened here was Peter and John were arrested. They were put on a sham religious trial of sorts uh, and they were questioned over this healing. In whose name did you act? In whose name did you speak? What's going on here? There was some authority that the religious leaders had and it was demonstrated by their ability to be able to arrest and hold Peter and John overnight. Their attempt here, and we read it in, in chapter 4 and verse 19 here, they attempted to silence, to curtail, to restrict them. That, but, but Peter and John resisted and they stood there and they said, no, we will not comply. And there's a lesson there for us all. When the world comes against us, we must simply stand our ground and say, we will not comply. We will not comply. But they were emboldened not just by the power of the Holy Spirit, but they were emboldened because critical mass had been reached. What do I mean by critical mass? I mean the point is, there was such a move of God, there were so many people being saved, thousands of people being saved left, right, and center, that in order to try and shut the church down... It would cause far too much of a ruckus. It would cause more than a stir. There would be civil war. So they had to be very careful about how they uh, responded. And we can see this in verse 17 of chapter 4. Uh, the religious leaders could only really request that Peter and John don't carry on. Oh, please. Uh, uh, they conferred amongst each other. and said, well, maybe just don't do it, please. You know, for our sakes, just, just be quiet. How many times have you heard that in, you know, out in society, you know, people saying, well, you know, faith is a private thing, you know, by all means, you have your Christian beliefs, but keep it to yourself. Keep it, just hold, just hold on to it yourself. What is an opinion if you just talk to yourself about it? I don't know about you, but I know that what I believe is the truth. And I know that what everyone else believes is false and it's landing them in a very bad place. So surely that should motivate me and want me to tell them the truth. I'm not going to be silent for anyone. People tell me to be silent, I'll just speak even louder. It's very simple. Brian's already there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to um, cover a reasonable bit in, in a fairly uh, kind of warped, uh, uh, time warp as it were, um, because we're going to uh, rattle on as quick as we can here. We're going to be looking at resistance here. What does it mean to resist? Um, and it's important um, to distinguish between resistance and rebellion. It's a very important distinction. Um, it, it, when we look at Daniel, uh, chapter 6 and verse 10, um, after the law is passed that bans him from praying, um, the, 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 the Bible says there that he went into his room, he opened the window, and he prayed to the Lord as God. And the key words at the end of that verse is that he says, as he always had done. Okay. Now, the reason that that's important is because that's resistance. What is resistance? Resistance is carrying on doing things regardless of what happens around about you. Okay, when laws come against you, in the case of Acts 4 here, when the religious leaders try and stop you from healing in Jesus' name, all you do is you stand there and you resist. Why? Because that's what they were always doing. Rebellion would be a law comes in to stop something happening and then you start doing something as a reaction to that law. Right? I've got many friends that work in the pro-life movement. They do a lot of uh, invaluable work uh, around uh, abortion clinics. They go to places uh, like Christian festivals uh, itself. I, I have to say, remarkably, this year they were doing a display in Keswick. Uh, during the Keswick Convention, some people saw it. They contacted the Keswick leaders, um, and uh, the Keswick leaders put out a statement saying they were saddened by the presence of these campaigners, saddened by the presence of people showing the reality of the slaughter of the unborn that's going on. What has become of it when we've got a major Christian organization saddened, embarrassed, that people are standing for the truth? You see, we're fighting against a problem within our own sphere to begin with before we can even start looking at the wider world. There's a book I meant to bring it this morning um, called Live Not By Lies. Um, 
by Rod Dreyer. Thoroughly recommend you read it um, in, in, in uh, very snapshot terms. Basically, he uh, has done a lot of work over in, in Russia and that part of the world, and he's looked at the rise of Soviet uh, communism um, and uh, looked at the parallels of what's going on in America, and of course, there's a lot of parallels over here as well. There's a new edition coming out in October that's going to be some more, it's going to have a forward on it um, that's related specifically to the UK as well. So if you haven't got a copy yet, wait another six weeks and you'll get the UK edition that's coming out. Uh, but it's a fantastic book. Um, it's, it's got some brilliant write-ups and it's really good about how do we stand for truth in an age that they're trying to convince us that the lie is the truth. Now, in 1984, there's a line in it that says um, the, the party, the establishment, the authorities taught you to believe the lie of your eyes or to not believe what your eyes actually see. So you see what I see here is a table in front of you. Actually, it's a chair. That's what that basically means. It's lying and convincing yourself that it's, that, that, that it's a lie. So let's have a little gander through these uh, verses. Verse 23 of chapter 4 here. We're going to read through uh, until verse 31 here. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. The them here is Peter and John. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, and, and this is the people that they've returned to, the church basically, uh, and this is the whole church got together and had a, a mighty prayer meeting. This was their response. And they said, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of your father, our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, among, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. There's that word again. I always think that when the word is repeated, God is trying to get us to focus on that word. And what is it that he's trying to say to us here today about the need to be bold? We're going to be looking here just now at thinking boldly firstly, secondly, praying boldly, and thirdly, acting boldly. Thinking, praying, and acting with boldness. First, boldness defined. I saw a definition that I thought was, I, I just read it and I thought, that's it, that's it, encapsulated perfectly. It says, it's the willingness to take risks and act innovatively. The willingness to take risks and act innovatively. Other words that you might use as a synonym instead of boldness, courageous, daring, fearless, heroic, or resolute. But then what about the opposites to help us understand what it's not? Timidity, fearfulness, feebleness, or cowardliness. And I wonder this morning, which of these would you like to be? But first, thinking boldly. Everything, folks, starts in our minds as thoughts. Everything starts in our mind as thoughts. The mind is a powerful place because it directs us on towards actions and what we do. Uh, we cannot begin to contemplate revival in the church or even Reformation society and the nation if we are not prepared ourselves to be bold and confront evil of the day and that starts with thinking boldly we defend the gospel in order to advance the gospel doing so is to engage in the spiritual war we read in second corinthians uh, uh, chapter 10 uh, and paul writes about the destroying the lofty arguments of the enemy taking thoughts captive taking thoughts captive saying no I'm going to put that aside. That is not a thought that I'm meant to have. I'm going to choose to take on the thoughts of the kingdom of heaven. And in Ephesians 6 and 12 says that we wrestle not against flesh but spirits. So it's a spiritual battle that we're engaged in that starts in the mind. And James 1 talks about where does sin start. Uh, it, sin starts as temptation before it's actually birthed as an action there. But it starts there as thoughts in the mind. 
So if you want to stop sinning, if you've got an issue with sin in your life, I don't know who this is for here this morning, but if you've got an issue with sin in your life and maybe you've been going around this cycle of sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And you're sitting there and it's bogging you down and you're sitting there and thinking, will I ever be able to overcome this? Will I ever be able to get through this? The simple answer is you yourself in your own strength will never be able to get over it. But God, through the power of the Holy Spirit in you, will be able to break that cycle and will be able to stop at the point of forgiveness. Because when you look to the cross and you see what it is that Christ did for you on the cross and you saw the blood pouring down and you saw the bones broken, his body broken for you, you will say, that is it, it is enough. You're all I need. And you choose when those thoughts start to come in your mind. We have a choice to say, actually, are we going to take that thought captive and act to put it aside and take on the thoughts of the kingdom of heaven or are we just going to allow those thoughts to start coming over our mind? They can come into us through various different means. Films, little clips on social media can suddenly start controlling what you think can suddenly start filling your mind with different things. I, we, many of us face all these battles all the time. How many times have you gone out of the house in the morning thinking this is going to be a terrific day and the first thing you do is trip over the front steps, always been there for 25 years, but somehow you didn't notice it that day. Then you get to your car and you find that it's iced up and now you're running late because you needed to defrost the car probably in mid-August, the way we've been going this year. And, and all of a sudden, uh, you, you know, the whole day is, 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 can be ruined quite easily, can't it? Take the thoughts captive and decide, no, I'm going to be focusing on what God would have me focus on. So the starting point in thinking boldly is to be renewed. Romans 12 and chapter 2 says, do not conform to the pattern as well, but be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Ah, so the mind here is really rather central uh, to it. Then we move to James 4 and chapter 7, very famous verse, of course, it's always quoted the second half of it, isn't it? Resist the devil and he'll flee. Well, how do we resist? We get the first few verses there. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's what we need to do first. Submit to God. Get things in order. Then he will come by the power of his Holy Spirit and we'll be able to resist the devil because it's not in our strength but in his strength. Then we choose to set the mind uh, on the Spirit. Because as Romans 8 and 6 says, it says, when, we, when I set our minds on the things of the flesh, it brings death. But when we set our mind on the things of the Spirit, it brings life. And when we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 uh, to 24, we'll turn there um, and just have a little uh, read through there because it's quite key to understanding this uh, particular uh, point there. So Ephesians 4 and 17, and it says here, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Ah, there it is again, the minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed, there it is again, in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you see all the way through that passage there, there's a choice, an active choice that we can choose to make, to put off the old self, to put on the new self, to get rid of the flesh, to focus on the spirit, to take on God, to take away ourselves, more of God, less of us. And what happens? We start to change our mindset. So what do we put in our minds? Well, Philippians 4 and chapter 8 there, I won't go through the full list there, but you can look it up. Basically, it says, whatever is good and true and holy and so on and so forth, and the scripture's up behind me, um, those are the things that, to think on. Whatever is good. There's a battle for the mind because it's where things start. We need to allow God to fight that battle on our behalf and then focus on the things above and not below. Folks, when we start thinking boldly, it leads us to praying boldly because the thoughts in the mind is where it all starts. So if it starts in the place of thinking boldly, we move to the second part, prayer is where we wage war. 
The prayer room is the war room. Arthur was singled as 20 plus people in this back room on Friday night waging war in the spiritual realms. That's what we do here. Did you know? Did you know this, this house is a, is a war room? Huh? That's actually what we are. We are actually really soldiers of the living God. Every church should be a house of prayer. Every church should be a house of prayer. The church's response here to their attempted shutdown of the gospel was to turn to prayer. And they prayed boldly. And they said, Lord, we're not going to be defined by the circumstances. We're not going to be defined by whatever they try and throw at us. We're not going to be defined by people being arrested and people being shut down here and there. We will move on in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then as we flick back there, what do we find? As a consequence, we find at the end there, it says uh, 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 that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This was a collective thing. They started out praying for their leaders, and they all got the blessing. The blessing of the Holy Spirit overflowed to them. Then let's look at Jehoshaphat facing enemy armies, uh, 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 approaching him. What does he do? Does he stand there and quake in his boots, hide in a cupboard, pull up the duvet or whatever the equivalent was back then? No, he turned to prayer. He called the whole nation to prayer. And fasting, might I add. I asked this morning, do you turn to prayer as a last resort or is it a part of your lifestyle? You know, many people turn to prayer in times of, 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 of desperation as a last resort. But the challenge for us is to make prayer a part of our lifestyle so much so that it's the first resort. That it's the waking thought when we wake up. You know, there's a constant battle, isn't there, nowadays with all the modern technology and I have it on a daily basis. Do I check my notifications or do I, which is going to confirm what's in the mind and direct me from there or do I say, actually, I'm just going to spend a couple of moments with the Lord before I start looking at anything else. And there's a battle there. There's, there's a decision uh, to have to make. When we note the prayers of the church here, what have we got? We've got five, uh, six par five parts of what they did there. Number one, they prayed with fervency. We can hear that in the language that they use. They started in praise to God. It's always a good place to start in praise to God. Every move of God that we read about in the Bible started with a praising and worship to God. Think about the walls of Jericho. What happened there? They went around and they praised God. They put the praisers at the front of the army. They raised themselves above the circumstances, verse 24. And in verse 25 to 27, we see that nothing surprised them because there was nothing new. It's the same world, same world that's always been against God. Didn't phase them. We folks must not be phased when opposition comes. In verse 29, they asked for the ability to continue, essentially to ignore the threats. Lord, rise up through the power of your Holy Spirit in us that we could just carry on regardless of what they try and throw at us. That's, that's a prayer of boldness there, folks, right there. They asked for signs and wonders to continue because they knew that it would bring more people to faith. If you just say to people, hey, have you met Jesus? Or that ridiculous cheesy line that you hear some people say, you know, they sort of sit down on a park bench and say, oh, excuse me, have you seen my friend Jesus? And little things like that. You know, it's not going to connect with people. But when people see the power of the Holy Spirit working, when they see what has actually happened, what has actually taken place, we see it even here with the religious leaders, they confirm to themselves, we cannot deny that there's been a miracle here. They were shaken themselves. Their response, of course, was all about controlling, uh, um, maintaining their religious order and control, but they could not deny the power of the miracle of what had happened. So the blessing overflowed to everyone in verse 31. We see that. And it's interesting here again, isn't it? The building literally shook with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I was thinking about that during the week, and I'm sitting there thinking, how amazing would it be if we were here one night and we're just praying, and we're praying for a move of God, and we're praying for a, a filling of the Holy Spirit, and what happens? We just literally, the building shakes, but there's no earthquake, it's just a move of God. How amazing would that be? Oh, we'd probably, you know, some people would start to worry because it was a new thing, but actually God can just move in amazing ways. We need such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit today in this place, in our lives, that the building would literally shake. And you see, the prayers of the church that day were informed by, but not defined by the circumstances. So it's right that we pray into the circumstances in which we find ourselves in. We don't just ignore the circumstances, but the way and the manner in which we pray is not defined by those circumstances. Right? They were already thinking boldly. So when the challenge came, they were able to pray boldly. It followed naturally. 
Now, folks, if, we want, if we're going to pray weak and feeble prayers, we can expect to become weak and feeble people. But if we pray bold prayers, we can expect to see strength through the power of the Holy Spirit as boldness increases in us. Bold actions are birthed in bold prayers. So finally here, acting with boldness. And if those bold prayers motivate us, they build us up, they can equip us to take action. But we actually need to decide to take the action. So just as we decide at the beginning to choose what to put our, in a, uh, focus our mind on, we choose to pray bold prayers. We now must choose to act boldly. We need to follow up these bold prayers with bold actions. If we don't act, then prayers are just petitions and empty words, just nice sounding things. Tick a box, yep, covered that. We need to actually do something. And that call is on every single one of us. Calling to act boldly is for all of us, not just the leaders. So they started out praying here for Peter and John that they would be filled with boldness, but they ended up, all of them, being filled with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and with boldness rose up within them all because God is not just about the priests and the leaders. God is about everyone. Do you see when the curtain tore when Jesus died on the cross, he tore the veil, he opened the ways for us all to enter into the throne room, praise God. It's not a spectator sport. It's a participatory sport. The Holy Spirit gives us boldness. He empowers us to act and speak out. The anointing of the Holy Spirit compels us to act. I know that in my life at times when I have come under difficulties and I have come under pressure for standing for the truth, I will stand for the truth, and I, but the, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that compels me to do that. I cannot not stand. You see, rather than just deciding, I find myself standing because the power of the Holy Spirit is taking me to places that maybe in myself I would feel too scared to do. And folks, now in our society is not a time for sitting back and expecting others to take a stand. Oh, we'll cheer you on. Well done, well done, well done. You know, remember, remember Parents' Day when your parents would come along and they would, they, they, they would cheer. I saw a Parents' Day recently where they actually had an egg and spoon race for the parents at Parents' Day. Uh, that, that would be interesting to see who was uh, fit and healthy to win that. But it, 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 this is the thing with the church today. It's not a time for looking at others and saying, that's great, they're going great guns. Look at them out on the street sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel is for all of us. Praying for people to be healed is for all of us. Not just for the man of God on the TV with a particular anointing. Oh, sure, it may have a particular focus on ministry there, but everyone can pray for healing. doesn't mean that everyone will have the gift of healing, but everyone is commanded to pray for people who are sick. There's far too much complicity and cowardliness in the church today. Expecting others to take a stand. Oh, yeah, we'll agree with it. We go along with it, but I, that bit's not for me. You know, now, my primary calling is not as an evangelist, but it doesn't mean that I don't go out onto the streets. It doesn't mean I don't share the gospel. It just means it's not necessarily primarily my major focus. But there are other people, even in the body of our church here today, who are evangelists. That's their calling. That's where their gifting lies. And so that's what they do. That's their focus. And that's right and proper. And when you put all those gifts together, you have a church that operates on every level in every area that it needs to be. Everyone playing their part actively in the different areas. We must all play our part to stand up, be counted, and speak out. And the early in chapter 4 here shows us that when many take a stand, the authorities cannot stop it because there's too many people. Today, there's so many attacks happening against Christians because they know that they have marginalized the church and is put to the side, so they think they can get away with it. Cancel culture. Arthur has spoken about that recently. Think about the National Prayer Breakfast in Scotland only a few weeks ago when all the MSPs turned up and, and there were so many people there praying all these wonderful prayers and then the MSPs, even so-called Christian MSPs, all marched off to Holyrood after that and voted to liberalize abortion laws. What exactly is going on in the heart? when you turn up to a prayer meeting and then march off into the place of iniquity. Dreadfully sad. So much of the church today is silent, it's compromised, and it's actually complicit. Many are at home being unhappily fitting in with the world rather than seeking to shape it. And because they don't seek to shape the world, they end up being shaped by the world. And we need to be on our guard against this. The transformed Christian is compelled to act, not just to be a quiet believer, we need to be actively Christians. History shows us that when we take a stand for truth, it eventually shakes the nation. Think of slavery. William Wilberforce, he took a stand, fought a fight over many, many years. He had a hundred defeats, but he got the one great victory. And we saw slavery outlawed in this country, first country to outlaw slavery, outlawed slavery 
two or three days before he died. He saw the victory. And we will see the victory of this nation being shaken again. Verse 8 there says, Now Peter, full of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's the emphasis there on the Holy Spirit because he rose up, he stood up in the power of the Holy Spirit. He challenges the religious rulers of the day based on their religious nonsense. And he says, whether it's right or wrong in the eyes of God to give more adherence to man or to God, well, it doesn't really matter because we are compelled to speak out for what we have seen happen. Compelled to speak. That's verse 19 and 20. They made it clear that they would not comply. Peter and John's response to the call not to speak in Jesus' name was to speak even more boldly. They state that they answer to God and not man. They reject the call to be silenced. They cannot because they're compelled to speak out. Just as thinking and praying boldly is a choice, it's a choice to act boldly, and it's a choice that we must take. We need to be emboldened today. We can't act in our own strength or we'll fail. It needs to be in the power, only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in a world increasingly hostile to the truth, we need to be bolder than ever before. Because remember that wonderful verse, if God before us, then who can be against us? that verse alone to strengthen us to go out regardless of what they try and throw at us so all three of these thinking praying and acting boldly they're all important and they're all linked together we need to be bold like never before it's not a time for shying away in timidity the church has been shut away it's been withdrawn itself from the public square for too long it's time now to re-enter the public square and to occupy until he comes that's what the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Luke. I think it's chapter 18, if I'm not mistaken. It says, occupy till I come. Amen. That's what we're going to do. We are occupiers. We're occupiers. We need to be bold like never before. Now is not a time for shying away, folks. I, re I saw this quote recently from a pastor uh, down south in England, um, and someone's turned it into a little graphic. It says, Great Britain, Jesus needs you. Recruiting now, brave men and women to stand tall, to speak up for Christianity. When the nation says, you cannot say this, we will say, oh yes, we can. We will speak louder, pray harder, and not be silent. We will not cower or fear. We will not stop. There is no point in living if it is not for Christ. That was Pastor Chris Wickland. Some of you may have heard of him. He has a, quite a good uh, prophetic uh, ministry. And he's speaking out on a lot of what's going on. And the world is looking for people to be bold. So they end up looking, because the church is missing in action, they end up looking to people like, uh, uh, like, like Andrew Tate, who have got misplaced priorities. He's a strong man, sure, physically, yeah. But do you hear some of the stuff coming out of his mind and the man's a Muslim and people in this country start trying to follow him? It's misplaced direction. We need to focus here on the word of God and look to the things above and not beneath. So we need to dare to be different, to stand out, speak out, run the risk of making an impact. I said at the start here, boldness is the willingness to take risks and to act innovatively. I asked, what do you want to be? Do you want to be courageous or cowardly? Do you want to be daring or timid, fearful or fearless? Well, today, let us decide to think boldly in getting rid of timidity, to pray boldly, dare to petition to God for the big things when we're thinking on the big things, and then finally to act boldly, where the Holy Spirit will compel us to act boldly when we pray boldly. We must, folks, stand up for the truth. We must expose all the evil in society. We must call out the church where it has sought to fit in with the world. We must call out the religious dogma in the church that has held back a move of God many times, and we must decide each of us individually right here today now to be bold for Jesus and I finish with this final uh, uh, quote from this what is this song the children's song be bold be strong for the Lord your God is with you hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word here to us this morning. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would embolden us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would fill us with an indwelling of the power and anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, that you would raise us up for such a time as this, Lord. Lord, bring us out of timidity. Bring us out of cowardliness. Bring us out of fearfulness. And take us to a place of courageousness. Take us to a place of fearlessness. Take us to a place, O oh God, where we would boldly stand for the truth and not be concerned or worried by anything anything that this world may try and throw at us. Why? Because you are greater than anything that anyone could ever say or do to us.
Lord, we thank you that you have already won the great victory on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that we are free to stand here today because you died for us, because you died for our sins. You died so that we could live. And we thank you, Jesus, that you live today. We can go and visit the grave of every other religious leader, but we can't visit your grave because you are not there. You have risen. And we thank you, Jesus, Lord, that when we call upon your name, that you raise us up, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. You don't just leave us to our own devices, but you fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, I pray this morning that you would cause us, Lord, to think on the things above, that would lead us to pray bold prayers, to pray and believe for big things in this nation, that would lead us to act boldly in all strength of the truth, Lord. Let us not waver one iota from the truth. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.